good evening, everybody. My name is Kip Morrill. I am one of your hosts for the Bluff Creek Project podcast. And as always, I'm joined by my good friend, Kate Hieronymus, who is coming to us live from downtown Des Moines, Iowa. Tate, how you doing, buddy? Good. How are you, my man? I am doing fantastic. I'm here in uh, California, in Sacramento area, and believe it or not, it was almost 100 degrees here this uh, earlier this week. So it's starting to feel like summer. Uh, it's nice, and I'm sure that if you get up to 100 degrees, you might have some humidity there. Am I not? Uh, am I correct? It's pretty dry here, actually. I mean, it's just hot and dry. Oh, Welcome wow. to the Midwest. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yep. Huh? Well, awesome. Well, you know, this is our sixth podcast so far, believe it or not. And I am pretty stoked to have this guest, um, probably one of the most knowledgeable people that I know when it comes to the history of Bigfooting and just it's like a walking cycle encyclopedia. And there's really no better place than to sit around the campfire late at night and talk to this gentleman. And so without further ado, I'd like to welcome Stephen Streifert to the uh, to the show. Hello. Stephen, Hello. good evening. How's it going? Greetings. It's fine out here in uh, ghost town, Willow Creek, um, <laughs> quarantined, uh, crawling with weirdos, uh, people coming and knocking on my door, even though I'm closed. It's a little strange out there. Strange times these days, and and even in uh, Willow Creek, it's strange, huh? You would think that being a smaller town, you might not be as impacted, or quite the quite the difference. I guess would be that um, you're probably impacted yeah. more at times. Yeah, you know, it's kind of like I told Bobcat Goldthwait when he came out here to research that film. Um, it's it's even more weird here uh, in the small rural communities. Uh, you you see humanity in its raw state. And you scratch the surface, and there's history and mysteries there, um, just beneath the surface. Uh, it's not like in a big city where everything's buried um, under massive amounts of civilization and concrete and uh, all that stuff. <laughs> Wow. So, Steve, you know, um, you've been in Willow Creek for a while. And, of course, everybody knows, or if they don't know, um, Stephen is the owner of the iconic Bigfoot books. So that's kind of a place where a lot of people, a lot of Bigfooters, when they come into town, when they come to Willow Creek, when they're headed to Bluff Creek, one of the first places they'll end up going is into Stephen's bookstore. And I was one of those people. And, gosh, Stephen, it's probably been... Well, over 10 years ago now, believe it or not. So time just flies. But um, be interesting to hear how did you end up in this madness and how did you end up with the bookstore and being in Willow Creek? Yeah. Well, it's it's interesting to think that Bluff Creek Project is now 11. We're 11 years now going this year. It's just bizarre. But, um, you know, in 2001, I moved out here to Willow Creek. Um, not really at that point, not really thinking much about Bigfoot still. Uh, it, you know, it was something that was in my childhood from 1970s, you know, uh, seeing Bigfoot documentaries and the dive into it. And stuff. So, uh, you know, coming here, I was able to uh, slowly kind of realize that Bigfoot was part of this area up here in Humboldt, you know, as I was going to school. So when I finished with the grad school courses, I just looked around and thought, you know, I should probably just stay here. I like it here. Uh, I can sell books for a living here. And the next thing I knew is I kept noticing the Bigfoot over and over again uh, until it sort of planted the seed in my mind. I, I'd pick up the Bigfoot books in the shops when I was, you know, out doing the business. And um, those books, you know, they drew me back into it after – decades of being away from it and that's when i realized um there's that jim mclaren statue on the corner that's been sitting there uh, since 1967 uh and i realized you know that bluff creek film site is around here somewhere you know where the hell is bluff creek and 
I was um, already in the process of trying to move out here when I decided I was going to go find Bluff Creek, you know, but I had, I still didn't know where it was. And pretty much almost by accident, I moved right next door to the, the land of mystery of, uh, of Bigfoot. And um, it took over slowly but surely uh, what most of my life was taken over by. So um, in 2005, I opened this bookstore because I needed a public uh, connection to the world somehow and uh, wanted, of course, an office space that didn't take over our whole house uh, that um, wasn't necessarily going to be a Bigfoot venture. But uh, I did call the store Bigfoot Books, um, you know, kind of like other people use Bigfoot in the name of their businesses. But um, once I had this shop called Bigfoot Books, these mysterious people in camouflage or, you know, adventure suits and funny hats started coming in here. Uh, you know, I'd see their Jeeps and off-road vehicles out in my parking lot. I'm like, what the heck's going on? These were the Bigfoot culture people. And, you know, um, I didn't really know that there was such a big connected culture out there. Uh, we had the 2003 International Bigfoot Symposium here in town. So I did meet all those people back then. 2003 was kind of my introduction to the Bigfoot thing as a serious topic. And uh, I, I met a lot of people who were very serious about it. Like, you know, I was there with my buddy from down on the coast and we were joking around about hoaxing some tracks just for fun. And Bobo was standing there. He said, you do that. I'm going to have to kill you. <laughs> so That was the very first time I met Bobo and he's already threatening to kill me. Uh, Great. You know, of course he's joking when he says that, but, um, uh, that that is basically how I got started and meeting these people they were all so fascinating and diverse uh, curious sometimes strange but usually pretty intelligent uh, adventurous people so I, I really got lured back I got lured into this Bigfoot thing um, and for a while there I was really deeply into it like uh, I was almost a 100% believer for a while uh, which, you know, might strike some people as odd considering that I'm sort of notoriously skeptical nowadays. Well, I think you're a healthy skeptic, but that leads us to the big, big question. We like to ask all of our guests, since this is the Bluff Creek Project podcast, and it does have to do a lot with the 1967 iconic film that was filmed down there on October the 20th, 1967. So, Stephen, big question. Is it a real, was it real? Was it a person in a suit? <laughs> um, I don't know. You know, that's my official position, uh, actually. Um, and uh, maybe it needs to be nuanced a little bit because the fact is that when I look at the thing nowadays, I don't feel very inclined to believe in Bigfoot at all. But, uh, because there are sightings, uh, there, there are claims of sightings and encounters and activity and evidence finds and examples such as the Patterson film, which to me has always been uh, very intriguing, you know, uh, even though obviously it doesn't prove anything. And uh, for every argument that you can make that supports its reality, uh, there's a good argument against it. <laughs> Um, as we've seen, you know, the arguments will go on forever uh, as to whether that thing is real or not. But, uh, you know, half the time when I watch it, I, I see it and it looks ridiculously fake. Uh, but other times it just strikes me as way too uh, realistic in certain aspects that, um, you know, may be <laughs> uh, the features of a real creature. Uh, if Bigfoot is real, what's to say that it did, didn't look like that, you know? Um, but um, obviously there's only one good film like that. The rest are pretty much bad. Um, mm -hmm. 
and well, certainly not on quality film, but on shitty video, you know, like the, um, the Freeman video, for instance, it's such a low quality that you can't really, you can't really tell anything about it except that it's a big hulking form walking in the woods. Mm-hmm. Well, and a lot of people will come back and say, and, they, and I always mention this is that, so that's the best evidence you've got after 50 years that two cowboys riding on their horses just happened to be with an eight millimeter camera and came upon one and filmed it. And that's it. We, I mean, we've got, you know, it's, and it's hard to kind of, again, try to, you know, get through all the, the junk that's out there on YouTube to find what could be potentially something that's real. Um, certainly, you know, we've gotten some really good thermal footage from Bart, but um, yeah, but that's always the argument that this is the best we've got 50 years ago eight millimeter or 16 millimeter sorry but um what do you what do you say to that yeah it's it's a it's a pretty good sign uh that the thing doesn't exist you know with the attention that's been given to it by a lot of people and i'm not talking just fly by night you know amateurs but in certain cases you know well-funded projects have gone after bigfoot and uh, they come back with such insubstantial reports that it's almost embarrassing. Uh, people will claim a Bigfoot encounter from just about anything. You know, uh, you hear the the people coming back from those BFR expeditions or whatever, um, and you know it's like rocks are flying and branches are breaking and things are knocking and howling <laughs> in the night, but. Like, you know, we've joked around so many times when I go out to Bluff Creek or, you know, even in my own backyard here in Willow Creek, which is just as wild, really, uh, or even more so in a way, uh, I hear that kind of stuff all the time. And it doesn't really flip my wig, you know, it, if, if it's something that goes over the line into very strange, you know, then I'm able to, to say, wow, what the heck is that? But, uh. You know, most things I think can be explained with ordinary causation and certainly don't need to bring in anything more than the hypothesis of an animal at this point. Um, well, what, like what's so this? many other people are going on to the woo, um, you know, which has, I guess, some basis when you consider the fact that um, its its origin is really from the Native American culture. And in particular, the spiritual side of that, of those cultures. So um, and, and if Bigfoot exists in the native terms, it's, it's not an animal in an ordinary sense. What's that yeah. saying that, uh, that the sense. saying that says um, it's, it's not a lie. If you believe it, <laughs> could it, could it also be said the same oh. thing for a legend? It's, it's not a legend. <laughs> if you believe it. So I think that there there's go. a certain amount of uh, people that go out because they want to believe so strongly. They want to believe that they're having an experience. I've been out yeah. there. I don't know how many times I've had, I, I guess I could say nothing of any, something that would point that direction. But I do, I know a lot of people say, well, if somebody doesn't believe, just take Dr. Meldrum's book and throw it in their face and say, read this. And I've read it. <laughs> it's a very convincing book, and and that book, when I read it in two thousand three or whatever it was, uh, very, I came very close to being one hundred percent believer. Uh, but even Meldrum says he's like ninety five percent. You know, um, there is that skeptical reserve that you have to take uh, if you're going to approach it as a science uh, or a an objective empirical inquiry, you know, uh, if you want to just approach it as an experience, you could go out there and have your spiritual experience, your vision quest, you know, your um, mushroom tea, if you want, you know, you could um, do all these things, uh, go on a snipe hunt like we used to do back in the Boy Scout, Cub Scout days, you know, there was always some grown up who wanted to convince you that there was like a monster out there. <laughs> you know? and i remember being on site i was like what the heck are we looking for again i mean i, I don't know but but 
there's that feeling of mystery from like when you were a kid, when you maybe went on your f- first outdoor experiences um, that you can rekindle. And uh, it's as a grown up, of course, it, it's um, you can rekindle it in a more mature way. Like what if Bigfoot is real? You know, what if these things are really out there? And once you have that notion in your head, the outdoors experience is very much changed. You know, it's way more mysterious and um, there's a sense of exhilaration you can get from it that uh, it can be very spooky, you know, very, very um, much all absorbing, you know. And I think people want that kind of experience in these days, you know, where everything is virtual and, uh, experience through a screen or a, a medium of some kind, you know, they want to have yeah. a, a wild outdoor mystery and Bigfoot is perfect for that. Um, even if it isn't real, even if it's not a real animal, it has a force <laughs> of culture. Uh, like Kip was saying, a legend, you know, um, but if you believe in the snipe, uh, you're going to have a snipe encounter probably if they're, if you're out there with like uh, some good grownups, who know how to fake it and mystify you and get you out there running in the dark, you know, you might, you might stumble upon something very strange. Yeah. Luckily, luckily the guys I go with don't really do that. I think. Well, we all like to think that we're approaching reality in a rational way, but we have to admit too that, uh, you know, uh, humans are subject to folly. You know, we are um, a kind of a gullible and goofy, naive species. It's just now um, sticking our head up from, you know, the caves and looking at the cosmos and trying to understand our position in it. And, I mean, just in the last hundred years, look at what we've discovered about it. Uh, We went from believing that we were the center of all of this and to knowing that we're just among infinite numbers of galaxies and stars. Yeah. So we, we in a way, don't know squat, right? But, um, (laughs) um, you know, it's good to, to learn how to think and learn how to approach things rationally so that um, when we're building our knowledge, it's actually real and reliable knowledge as opposed to uh, 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 castles built in the sky on clouds, you know? So Stephen, I I guess I'd call this the finding Bigfoot effect. So my question would be the amount of people that showed up in your store that were looking for, information about bluff creek and the and bigfoot in general before the show compared to during and then now after the show can can you actually see a, an effect that that show has had oh yeah well that and the social media in general uh had a huge impact you know from 2003 to 2010 was a very, very different community of people. Uh, once it became a big media thing, I mean, you started to see the emergence of people like, uh, you know, Team Taser and uh, Sean Evidence and um, the various uh, people running kind of a media um, um, on the internet kind of thing, promoting it through Facebook. Uh, it was really different. The, those old timers were like used to things like writing letters, you know, s- snail mail, uh, Bigfoot reports. You know, so it, it might take a while for, for a report to get made and uh, to circulate around. And you had a few newsletters, you know, the last of which is the Perez one. But, uh, you know, the, the, the way that they communicated was radically different than it is now where you could have 10 Bigfoot reports in one day, you know, I mean, literally on these, on these group pages, uh, the, the believer ones, especially, uh, which I don't really go to very often anymore. Um, (laughs) But if you look at the groups like Bigfoot now or whatever, they're asking all these same questions that 
we thought we had answered already 10 years ago, like this massacre theory that has emerged again, for instance, uh, the MK Davis business. And, you know, we, we had debunked that junk in 2008 and now it's here it is again. And, um, there's, it's almost like there's a cycle where these, these dead and gone things reemerge from the grave and they'll come back to walk the earth. Uh, and I think a lot of that, um, combined with the commercialization of it, you know, the, the conferences aren't in serious intellectual affairs. They're not scientific. They're not even, you know, very rational. They're just, they're more like fan conferences, like the comic cons, you know, sci-fi uh, type stuff. Um, you know, it, it's the promotion of monsters and mysteries rather than uh, let's find an animal. Like, like, let's learn how to act and investigate like scientists and go out there and try to be rational and sane about it. Like those yeah. guys did back in the days of John Green and De Hinden and Byrne and, um, you know, Krantz and Titmus. They were trying really hard to be uh, rational and to, to not like let their minds stray into these foolish, um, irrational forms of uh, belief. You know, that it was hard enough to be a Bigfoot believer or investigator even. Um, or a researcher, then, you know, to uh, try to establish some kind of credibility was not the easiest thing. Uh, but John Green, you know, a rational, sober minded guy like that, he did a lot to put the field of study on, you know, solid foundations. But I mean, since then, and I hate to say it, my friend's TV show, you know, um, it, it, it's like anything goes, you know, you, you want to be able to say that's a squatch at least twice per hour. Right. You know, uh -huh. and, um, you know, it's, it's, it, it's really debatable whether that show did any good for the Bigfoot field or just sold it out completely. Um, and, and look at all the junk that's come after that. It makes finding Bigfoot look just classic and excellent comparatively. <laughs> well, do you think that social social media has been bad or good? I mean, it's certainly it's made it more accessible. And I, I'll be the first to admit that my experience has been that it's opened up a world of getting to know people. And and, um, you know, I wouldn't have known gotten to know you or Robert or Rowdy or Bart or anybody had it not been for social media. And it's certainly been something I've really enjoyed. But there's a downside to that, too. Certainly it's more accessible. But yeah, like the the trolls and the, the obsessive freaks like um, certain bad artists we know, you know, who won't, <laughs> who won't give it a rest, you know, and who, who are gossiping and just terrible uh, game players, you know, um, that's what they almost live for. And it's not about like Bigfoot research or, uh, whether Bigfoot is real or not, or what we what can we learn about the history of the thing? You know, how can we learn how to think and be uh, proper intellectual? You know, practitioners of investigative uh, uh, enterprises. Now, nah, I mean, it, it's it's all about you know who's stabbing whom in the back, you know, and who's on which side of the war, you know, and. <laughs> Right when you know what the war is about, there's like some new war that breaks out and like subcategorizes. Uh, so you, you can't even count on the war lasting for more than a year, you know, before it, you might find yourself on the wrong side of it. Um, yeah. But there's so, like, I think it's, Facebook has been great because I've met so many cool people and, you know, really literally could travel the whole country just by going from state to state through my Facebook friends, you know, uh, in the Bigfoot world, which is, so, I mean, that's, cool. which is a positive thing, certainly. Like and, you, and, guys. Uh, you know, there are, there are many negative things. And like you said, there, there tends to be a lot of, um, I think interesting conflicts. I think that oftentimes I kind of, 
I, I equate it to being in traffic with people and people are very impatient. But if you were to snap your fingers and all of a sudden the car was gone and everybody was standing there, you wouldn't, you wouldn't say certain things. You wouldn't treat people a certain way. And I think the Bigfoot world is the same way. When, when you're actually in person and you're with people, you know, it's, it's just a much more friendly, uh, you know, atmosphere, I guess. But when people have anonymity or they have a computer screen behind, you know, on the other side, it's, I think it does have a tendency to have people maybe act maybe differently than they would be if they, you know, were in person and, and brings out a, a different kind but certainly the, the whole idea that social media has brought about a lot more people, I think that that's, that's, that can be positive, certainly. But um... Well, you know, I mean, a lot of these Bigfoot conferences are, they're extraordinarily fun. You know, uh, a lot of the times I didn't want to, like, go because... I figured, well, someone's likely to take a shot at me one of these days, you know. Uh, I mean, I actually <laughs> have received enough death threats and stuff to kind of halfway take it seriously. But, uh, you know, the truth is that once I go to the conference, it's like you can see that person that you just had some big dispute with and you're all uh, smiling at each other and shaking hands and stuff, you know. And like, people like come up to you and give you a hug or something. It's like, oh, sh <laughs> didn't I just debunk your like Bigfoot in a under the tree Keebler elf video? <laughs> right. <laughs> well, I don't know. But I mean, yeah, I, when there's not the protection of the road or the screen, you know, you're not you're less likely to have road rage. Well, I've noticed yeah, that when I've been, exactly. uh, you know, I've had the, the uh, I've really enjoyed Beachfoot. And one of the things that's been really interesting about that is, you know, of course, it's just, it's a very diverse group of people. Um, but everybody interacts. And then the other part is, there's no cell coverage. And so nobody's on their phones. Nobody's typing around. And, and so it forces you to interact with each other on a, a more personal level. And I think that that's always always uh you know a benefit so and of course you know Stephen, when when you or i and tate and rowdy or robert or anybody are, are down there at, at laos camp you know jamie sitting around the the campfire uh it's just a different vibe you know we don't we're not we don't have a lot of the distractions and so you know we can debate certain things and have conversations and and uh it's just a different vibe and to me that's why I enjoy the whole field of Bigfooting. I enjoy that there's still a mystery out there. I enjoy that uh, <clears throat> being around intelligent people that are interested and interesting and are, are trying to find ways to, you know, basically put the, put the, the scientific method to, ta to, to task and, and see what we can find out. And so would you say that that would be, you know, you've been – you're you're involved in it you're a healthy skeptic you've you are a huge part of the, the coalition which is our, our the facebook group that you basically started um but what keeps you going what really keeps you interested in 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 this whole thing is there anything that kind of makes you not want to not want to give it up well you have to admit it's a stimulating culture and um, once you're in, you know, it's hard to leave. <laughs> it's kind of like uh, the mafia, you know. They, <laughs> I was going to say that. <laughs> try to get out, they pull you back in. <laughs> or what is it? Just, you know, I mean, it's, it's like, like the. Uh, I'm not even. Oh, I was going to say the. Go ahead. I was going to say the, the song, uh, you know, Hotel California. You can check out, but you can never leave. <laughs> yeah, except there's not as good a cocaine source as there was back then. But um, <laughs> here we are. I mean, the Bluff Creek Project, I think, tries to be very kind of very basic. You know, we started out, we wanted to find where the film site was. So we kind of asked the question that nobody was asking because they already assumed that some expert knew, you know. And what we asked was, you know, why doesn't anybody know how to go there and show 
the big tree and where the first sighting occurred and where the trackway was and where are those stumps and logs and things that ought to still be there, you know, and like asking such a simple basic question about like pieces of wood in the ground, a Creek that's flowing over rocks and sand and gravel, you know, shouldn't be that controversial, but of course it was because there's sacred cows to the left, right, center, all around you. I mean, any anywhere you move in the Bigfoot world, you're going to kick over someone's cow, right? And uh, that's when I immediately realized with Ian, when I met Ian at the Yakima Bigfoot Roundup, was that if we were going to investigate the history of Bigfoot, we had to tip over all the sacred cows and not care. Not not worry that maybe oh Peter Byrne might not like us anymore, you know, or what if Christopher Murphy doesn't doesn't like us because we showed that his book has the wrong site, right? Or well, look, it's still ongoing this war with M.K. Davis, you know, because he still believes that he's got the right film site and we didn't. I mean, even though it's mathematically proven and accepted by uh, the most uh, accomplished uh, people in the field. You know, M.K. Davis wants to have his own little film site off to the side there. Um, why is it so controversial? Because, you know, to me, it's not a matter of whether M.K. Davis is a nice guy. I really couldn't care less about that. But if he's wrong, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to come out and say, you're wrong. You know, this is not true. And I'll show you how it's not true. And if I don't know, I will find out what the truth is. And like, that's all we did. Uh, And somehow, you know, it won us a lot of uh, friends and also a lot of enemies. uh, Such that like now uh, we have the humble Martin, for instance, you know, which is, I think, a very good accomplishment that we've been able to record and document them over several years now. A, a species that's more endangered than Bigfoot would be, you know, Yeah, a subspecies, but we still get people trolling us. I mean, almost every day at times about, Oh, they're not, they're not endangered. You know, um, weasels taste good fried up by the campfire, you know, all this crap. Like, you know, why don't you, why can't they just take a step back and say, good job guys. You know, that's awesome that you guys had a project and you kept with it for 10 years, almost, you know, you, you put uh, trail cameras up that ran for the whole year, all day, all night, every day of the year for all that time. And you've documented a real living rare animal that that should be an accomplishment in cryptozoology. I mean, even though obviously the uh, humble Martin is not the big hairy monster that we might want to find. You know, uh, I regard it yeah. as a, a, a rational se- a quasi-scientific activity that we're doing where, where we're looking for Bigfoot as a sort of hypothesis, but we're willing to learn from anything that is out there, you know? And if, if it's a weird monkey sound in the trees, Man, I'm happy to learn that that's an owl, you know. I mean, I don't have to have it be an ape to, to you know, uh, make me feel good. <laughs> you know, <laughs> and we, we accomplished something. I mean, it's not bragging. It's just a very, very basic thing. You know, we looked and we saw and we reported it. And that's what all the Bigfoot groups should be doing. Uh, not, you know, trying to stretch their evidence and, and create this thing that they want to be real. They should be honest and and learn all of the skills that are involved, you know, including like all the outdoor skills, tracking and everything. So, you know, learn all your plants and animals, learn the history of your area, you know, study the native culture and the, the following folklore and try to find yourself a spot where you could go look and investigate. I mean, even if you don't find Bigfoot, it doesn't mean you're not a worthy researcher. I mean, look at the kind of thing that, uh, like Mark Mircell has done 
just in studying the Ape Canyon. Amazing, business. huh? He, he's done an yeah. amazing job. Yeah. He's a very smart guy. Well, I think he's, yeah, he's very similar to us, like what we were doing with the film site. And uh, I have always tried to advocate that kind of approach. Like, it doesn't matter, you know, if you get your desired result in the end. It's, it, what matters is the truth. And it, what matters is all the f- points of fact that are so fascinating, you know, that we didn't even realize about Ape Canyon because there were too many people that were just concerned with the Bigfoot creatures in there, you know, like they didn't even bother to look at the whole history. You know, I have it. to give, um, I have to um, give one of our folks a shout out. Um, Dustin Severs, he's done a, an amazing job uh, trying to unearth and, and pick up documentation and trying to, trying to, Piece, piece together some of the more detailed pieces of the film and and where the film was and where it went and I, I thought I, I thought that he's been an extremely uh, valuable addition to to the Bluff Creek project. Your thoughts? Absolutely. I mean, I'm glad he's there um, because I don't have to do that work. <laughs> you know, <laughs> this is the kind of stuff that Ian and I started out doing, but. Dustin, he's taken it to a whole other level um, in these micro issues. Like, on what day, where was Roger Patterson in 1968 or 9? You know, uh, was he in Kansas City showing the film or was he, you know, where these little details. Um, but, you know, if you're an investigative uh, historian, that those little details matter, you know. Absolutely. And how it all pieces together is is the real picture. Um, and, you know, uh, most people, like, don't even want to look into it. Uh, like, a lot of people, when we were first investigating, they, they, they said, you know, I don't want you getting all Danny Perez on uh, Bob Gimlin. Oh, you know? gosh. Like, because, uh, you know, Perez is the other one. He's, like, hard-nosed detective type uh, journalistic guy and we and we you know and we um, got to give a very interesting character we got to give a shout out to to danny too because you called him danny but daniel perez uh he is healing up at home because he had had his appendix removed and i think everybody knew that um he just suffered a pretty big loss uh when uh at 14 years of age uh his dog pre named for uh the runner pre fontaine um passed away so he's kind of had a, a run of some bad luck but um he's healing at home so. when it rains when it rains it pours. i know <laughs> but he's he's hanging in there i've been kind of texting with him back and forth and so i'm sure i, I know everybody's sending out some positive positive vibes and some prayers for him but uh just a big shout out to the editor of the longest running bigfoot uh newsletter the bigfoot times and as he always says, if you don't get it, well, you just don't get it. So, <laughs> so. Well, I don't know. I'm so glad that Daniel's sort of part of our project, even though uh, he, he he's not a joiner because he, you know, he has to be like the objective reporter. Yeah. But uh, I mean, he's helped us out a lot. And I think maybe we helped him out in some ways, you know, like, um, we finally resolved the issue of where the film site was. And in great part, it was because of his historical resources that we were able to document that site. Awesome. Uh, Even though like he, he was still kind of at a loss to find it himself uh, during all those years before. So, Uh, you know, we just are very happy to have people like this, you know, uh, anyone can come and associate themselves with the Bluff Creek project. And, uh, that's how we've gotten all of our new members like you guys and Rowdy and uh, Jamie and, um, you know, Bart and everyone else is sort of in the orbit. Uh, um, and we kind of just don't give a damn about these jealous trolls from Connecticut or whatever. <laughs> hey, Stephen, I got to ask. So I'm, I'll be the first to admit it. And I, I think that there's probably a lot of other people out there that may be in the same boat, but, I don't understand the whole massacre theory. What it, if you could kind of maybe give us a little history about it, because I just don't understand where it comes from, 
what it has to do with. And so, um, well, okay. It, it just, I'm going to keep it as brief as I may, uh, but um, somewhere around town here, there's a lot of stories that float around in rural Northern California and a lot of oddball people too, of course. Um, so you're going to hear a lot of stories, tall tales and monsters everywhere. And um, it, I mean, it's just amazing, really, you know, the, the richness of the culture. But um, one of the stories is that they killed a bunch of Bigfoots up in Bluff Creek around when that film was shot, you know, and um, like the stories from those days in the 50s and 60s, uh, it slowly has changed and morphed over the years. And uh, one of those people, uh, either Bobby Short or uh, M.K. Davis, heard this story, you know, and that's how M.K. Davis can sit there and say, it's not my theory, you know, like a tall tale that floats around a, a small rural area is not exactly evidence of something that really happened. And even though, you know, the fact is like, you know, the story about the oil barrels and uh, uh, logging wire and the stuff that was thrown around on the Bluff Creek Road back in 58. Well, I mean, I've heard that story like 20 different versions it's happened here, there, up, uh, you know, all around the area. It's happened with various different sets of characters, different logging companies, different years. I mean, obviously, there's a lot of storytelling going on, right? And the, the stories change uh, over the years and with each telling. Um, but there was supposedly a guy, uh, you know, from Hoopa, or maybe he lived on the Yurok land, but... Um, he said that there was some Bigfoots killed and then MK Davis came along and he found uh, this other film, which was shot by Renee de Hinden in August of 1967. And that film showed John Green and Keith Chiazari and a bunch of other guys, Dale Moffat, the dog handler, white lady, the tracking dog. These are the people who had come down from Canada to investigate the tracks that were found, you know, first on onion mountain, uh, John green was down here to look into that with the end. Um, and then green went back to Canada and they, um, they had another report. So he had to turn around and, and come right back, you know, and he got an airplane flew down here and they investigated these tracks, which were, you know, three different sizes this time. Uh, of tracks all over the road, um, these freshly plowed roads that they were making over the ridge there. Uh, and uh, that's where that footage came from that MK Davis thinks was shot during the same event as Roger Patterson and Bob Gimlin's recordings. Um, uh, obviously, we know, like, you know, from all the stories and all the evidence in the film that uh, Patterson and Gimlin were there in October at, I mean, at the 20th, like they said, probably, you know, because uh, you can see the, the, the trees have turned color. And I mean, anybody who knows our local area is not going to mistake that for autumn, you know, I mean, for uh, summer, like mm -hmm. it's fall, it's the fall colors. And, and MK Davis puts those two together and then he takes this um, low quality degraded uh, version of the film, which has a brown tone to it. And he says, you know, that looks like a pool of blood. You know, the first frames of the Patterson film, uh, you get a glimpse of not only the creature walking away, but the uh, segment of Bluff Creek that's at that crook in the corner where it turns from going east to west, it turns south. And what you what it looks like in that film is a pool because you, you can't see the rest of the creek going east and west behind the bank. And Patterson is downstream uh, starting the camera and running across the creek to get up on the other side following the subject up there. And it's, um, it's only in those degraded versions of it that it looks like a pool of blood. And um, 
inside of that pool of blood, there's like ripples of the shallow creek running over the rocks. But in one second, it looks like a body in the water, a dead body of a Bigfoot or something. <laughs> <Jeez>. <laughs> you know, so this is where the story evolved. And, you know, like a classic conspiracy theorist that he is, uh, along with his buddies like Polites and Steve Ishtal, the how to hunt guy, um, Scott Carpenter, they've revived this thing, you know, um, using Bobby Short as some kind of sanctified uh, prophet, uh, trying to um, once again, you know, denigrate um, the, the the heroes of Bigfoot culture. You know, they're all murderers, apparently, because, uh, you know, MK and Politis and those, all, all of them believe that. Uh, Bigfoot is some form of a human. Um, well, maybe not Carpenter, but, you know, Bobby Short certainly did. And so by saying that they shot Bigfoot dead, that, that they shot a whole family of them. They took a baby Bigfoot and tied it on the ground uh, um, as bait, you know, for more Bigfoots to come. I mean, this is pretty sick, and it's an accusation of murder. You know, it's not just the dead like Bob Titmus, who wasn't even there, but, uh, you know, John Green, he was still alive and Gimlin still alive. Um, people who supposedly participated in this massacre, wow. um, which of course never happened, right. you know, <laughs> I mean, even if that film is, is a hoax, even if like those guys were scoundrels and liars, I mean, I'm not saying they are or not, but, um, it doesn't mean that there's this massacre theory that you can make out of the ambiguous parts of the stories, you know? Yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, that's like the basis of it, you know? And so now there's apparently Gimlin's getting like threats, you know, there are people, people <laughs> once again saying mean and nasty things about uh, our, our heroes, you know? I mean, I know I said that there should be no sacred cows, but, that doesn't mean you just go push someone over out of spite and on false, false pretenses, you know, well, um, poor Bob Gimlin has to live, live with this. Which BS is just that is criminal. Yeah. I mean, the, anybody that's ever met or, or knows Bob Gimlin knows what a gentleman he is. He's a good man. And he's at the, you know, he's at that, you know, the, his twilight years and, to have to put him through mm-hmm. something so ridiculous, I just, it really does make me sick to my stomach. But I, I just, I don't think I ever understood quite what the whole, I, you know, the massacre theory was. So I appreciate you taking a little bit of time and just kind of explaining that. So I, yeah, I was just un, unaware. Well, it, it's, it, it's definitely one of those things that kind of took over. Um, a lot of the blogging I did, a lot of the research that we were doing in Bluff Creek um, also tended to try to debunk uh, the massacre theory, among other things, like the false claims of these guys who said they thought they had a film site in some other place, you know. Uh, but, I mean, since 2008, this has been going on. And, you know, I mean, I hate to think of it, you know, John Green on his dying days might have actually had to think of M.K. Davis and his horrible uh, slander and insulting accusations. I mean, I hate to think of an old man with maybe fragile health, you know, having to deal with this stress of of someone calling him a murderer. Uh, I mean, yeah. And like, you know, he doesn't even go on Facebook but, I mean, I've seen how nasty these people are because, you know, they, they, they say the same kind of stuff about us. You know, they'll, they'll go on there and lie about you. And the, you find your way into some comments on some, you know, post on Facebook group. And then you suddenly realize they're talking about you, Crazy. you know, or, or you see them talking about Bob Gimlin or, um, you know, saying, you know, I can't believe those guys are all murderers. I, they should be punished. Or, you know, I remember the 
GCBRO forum, they used to basically have death threats against Green. You know, like someone could go and kill those Canadians and stuff. I mean, this is the heinousness of like MK Davis is willing to stir this hornet's nest up. You know, uh, all these gullible followers who who don't have a enough experience in the field to know that this is wow. false. Um, and then he sends them flying towards whatever he wants to target. And um, there's going to be enough people to believe that kind of junk, you know, to cause misery and uh, it can uh, impact your, your private well, life. And, and Rus- you know? Russell Accord has really done a good job standing up in front of Bob and, and trying to keep these, people at an arm's length and so i i think bob's very fortunate to have somebody like that that's really looking out for his best interest so that's that's certainly a positive well, well certainly we've had our little uh, conference wars but i will say that bob certainly does appear to be very happy and prosperous and well days. taken care of um so, yeah so i mean when i see him happy and prosperous that's a good feeling and i'm i'm happy about oh, that good um yeah you know i mean he's a he's definitely the most prominent ambassador for bigfoot that there is currently a mm-hmm. uh, much beloved figure i mean i don't think that um he would hurt a fly oh, you my- know much less if, sloth family of if bigfoot. you've ever been around bob <laughs> and, and i have <laughs> And, you know, at a conference, around a campfire, I don't care where it is. I don't care who you are. Bob Gimlin is going to give you some attention. He's going to give you a smile. He's going to, he's just an extremely kind person. I've run into other Bigfoot, you know, I want to use my finger quotes, celebrities. And, um, you know, some have been not as, not that friendly sometimes. And I've never, Uh... ever witnessed Bob treat anybody with disrespect. That man has always treated people extremely kind. And, and I just hope that, um, that people give him that same respect. But I do think that, uh, that Russell Accord is really standing up for him and, and really does a good job with that. So, but you know, Stephen, I am really curious. Um, is there anything new going on? Is, have you, have you heard anything you know, on and around Bluff, or I'm sorry, Willow Creek. Are you are you hearing any backstories? Are you hearing any new information? What's what's going on? Yeah, I don't know. You know, the 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 uh, quarantined pandemic uh, situation has really put a, a damper on this time of year, which would be normally uh, bustling with. Uh, new research, you know, everybody getting out from their uh, winter cabin fever and out in the woods again, you know. Um, so we're kind of, you know, when there's not new things to chew over in the uh, investigative investigative areas, people will start chewing up the old ones and uh, each other, you know. Kind of like if you put a bunch of rats in a cage, they're going to eventually, you know, eat each other up. It's sort of how it's been uh, lately. But, uh, <laughs> you know, uh, I mean, with the resurgence of the massacre and people like the how to hunt guy trying to become like the new power force, uh, trying to take on people like Moneymaker and throw them off their throne, you know, um, it's just never ending. Um, the, the, the new generation of people so far are not impressing me at all. You know, um, it's hard for me to even remember their names, most of them, because they're just repeating the same old drivel. You know, that's what makes somebody like Tom Steenberg so special is like, here's a guy who's smart and experienced and he's been around and he's been in the, um, the fields since, you know, the time of the old timers. And what, and he, um, and what's his famous saying? Well, he's stick to the facts and never deviate from the facts. The facts. Yeah, <laughs> he's like never fallen into the trap of BS. Like, like so many of P- 
people, even the, some of the old time generation now, have fallen for the woo. They've just gone off the deep end. Um, yeah. Like, because they could spend like 40, 50 years looking into it. And at the end of it, it's like, well, I can't explain it. So it must be from outer space. Yeah. <laughs> you know? Well, it's been interesting because lately we've yeah, seen like- this. Um, so Thomas Steenberg is on Facebook now, which is really interesting. And uh, he just had a birthday. And so it's interesting to see him on there. And then um, recently, um, uh, Henry Franzoni, which has been, you know, a name that I've known, but um, but having him engage and kind of be on the on the internet, it's uh, it's really interesting. I don't. And, and what are your thoughts on those folks? Other, than, I, you just mentioned Thomas. Oh well, those guys are great, and it's great to have them in the Coalition for Critical Thinking and Bigfoot Research, uh, our group there on on Facebook. Uh, we have a lot of these old timers in there right now. So it's, it's really awesome. You know, um, Jim McLaren and Larry Lund and, yeah. uh, you know, the, the two ones you just mentioned people like that. And, and also a lot of the longtime skeptics are in there. Uh, guys like Aaron Swepson, um, as obnoxious as he is to somebody or other believers, you know, I like to see these, these people, uh, engaged, you know, um, there used they used to be maybe denizens of the old Bigfoot forums or whatever, but that that site never really did come back all the way. Uh, it's never been what it was. Well, as, uh, as so, as a, I mean, as a nine-time Bigfooter of the year, I I can totally hear what you're saying. Well, I, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Having Kip in there is always just overwhelmingly uh, an honor, you know, especially the the no pants posts and <laughs> well, that kind you of know, thing. my theory on bigfooting is a lot like I do with my career, and I say this: uh, I tell people that I take bigfooting very, very serious. I just don't take myself too serious, and that's uh, that's kind of my, yeah. my thing. A wise way to go, you know. If it wasn't. I mean, it's not about uh, our egos and our personalities. It shouldn't be about that. It should it should be about thinking clearly and and investigating uh, properly with good methodology and coming to uh, conclusions that are based on facts rather than um, you know wishes or personal rivalries or whatever. Like like nowadays, it's so much just a war on um, you know who's clan is fighting whom you know it really is like back in the days of elementary school you know when we had our little neighborhood fighting against the other guys and we actually had wars over the tree forts and stuff down in the creek beds um i mean it was like lord of the flies out there (laughs) some of the time well and that's why i really like thomas steenberg's his that whole idea of stick to the facts and never deviate from the facts and that's, that's, I don't think you can get any clearer or cleaner than that. Yeah. But what is a fact? Well, um, <laughs> well there you go. That, that's like a good point. Bigfoot, you know, it's, it's like people like to say there is no Bigfoot expert. Well, you know, if you're going to be honest about it, what are the Bigfoot facts? And I mean, the only real fact that we have right now is that it's, not been proven to exist that's a, <laughs> you know that's a great point uh, <laughs> that's the null hypothesis yeah right so uh you know what is it how do you even begin to question somebody who's um very obviously had an experience that they found to be potentially overwhelming out in the woods or whatever it was you know of possibly seeing or whatever encountering a Bigfoot, uh, how could how yeah. could that have, how can there be people who've had these overwhelming experiences, and they really don't seem to be liars, they don't seem to be crazy, they don't seem to be out of the ordinary or strange, but they'll tell you, I stood right in front of one, ten feet away from me. Yeah, you as a person um, I- investigating these things, you don't want to be gullible and 
um, believe every story. And, but on the other hand, you don't want to be so skeptical that you don't even give anyone a chance, you know? So what I do is I give them a chance. I say, well, the stranger seems honest, you know, I'm going to listen at least. And my friends who think they've seen Bigfoot, you know, um, I'm going to listen to them too. But on the other hand, you know, I'm not going to just believe them because I want to believe or because they're my friends, you know, I'm going to still have to say, uh, well, (laughs) could it have been a bear? Could it have been a shadow? Could it have been some strange glitch in your perception? People say they've had, you know, um, PTSD from it. Like I, mm-hmm. I've had them come in my story and tell me the stories. This one guy, he was trapped by a group of Bigfoot on this sort of uh, um, island. Uh, it was surrounded by like a creek. And um, he couldn't get back to his truck because it was parked on the other side where the supposed Bigfoot were. And he was terrorized by them the whole night. <laughs> and so by the time he, the daylight came, he just got the heck out of there. Uh, I mean, he was, he had been through hell and he told me like he was going to a therapist, uh, an ordinary guy, you know, definitely not a nut. And, you know, he didn't say anything weird. Like they spoke to him in his mind or they cloaked and vanished through a portal. I mean, he's just a guy who, who was trying to go camping and um, was terrorized by Bigfoot. <laughs> and he had no reason to <laughs> come out here in the middle of nowhere and tell me about that. You know, I mean, yeah, he, he didn't get on TV for it. He didn't get his name in a book. I mean, he didn't want me to publish it uh, uh, or with his name on it or anything. You know, he just wanted to have somebody listen to what had happened to him, apparently. <laughs> and, you know, I mean, a lot of people like they, they say I, I, they want to tell their story to people who are sympathetic because they're so tired of being questioned and called call, called crazy. Uh, but, I um, mean, you know, on the other hand, you really still ha- do have to ask these questions like, um, how can it be that this thing um, doesn't leave any evidence behind that can be assembled together and prove that it's a real animal? Uh, yeah. What was that thing you used, Kip? Occam's, Occam's, Occam's razor. razor the mo- yes. The most obvious, uh, the obvious, um, what am I trying to say, Stephen? Well, I mean, the, the, the simplest explanation is. is most likely to be true. But the, the way by saying simplest, it doesn't just mean that it's simple. It means uh, the thing that's based on the least number of assumptions, right? So, I mean, like a lot of Bigfoot people, they already are assuming Bigfoot is out there. So they'll put this thing together in their telling you the story. Like, you know, we heard wood knocks and then we heard a hoot. And then we heard a screech and then we, then, then something fell over and, you know, it was a big thump on the ground and, and they're not using Occam's razor because they're already thinking that it's a Bigfoot. I mean, I, I, when I listen to these stories, I'm, I'm forcing myself into the agnostic position and saying, um, well, um, what, what could cause a wood sound? What could cause, you know, the, the the animal sounds you heard do we have to assume it's bigfoot and you know if you're going to assume a, a bigfoot like a crypto monster like that why assume it's bigfoot why not just think it's the purple people eater right <laughs> i mean it could be any number of, of crazy monsters well, and and of course now we do have these the dog man and the chupacabra and uh, god knows what how else many times have you been at there. uh uh, sat there at Twin Lakes and listen to the barred owls go off. And if you wanted to believe that there are a bunch of monkeys on the other side of the lake, you could make yourself believe that. I'll tell you. Oh, yeah. <laughs> well, even if you're like in full knowledge that it's a uh, a barred owl and a spotted owls, uh, there's still this weird sense of mystery like in their crazy vocalizations. And 
it, it, it stirs you up inside anyway, so that it does kind of almost feel like a Bigfoot experience. Or, you know, <laughs> if, if there can be something that wacky sounding out there in the woods, well, then why not a Bigfoot? You know, add that on top of it, like a lot of people do. Um, they record coyotes and barred owls, and then they say, but wait, at, you know, one thirty and 44 seconds you're going to hear this little sound and you, you, you sit there with your headphones on, you're listening and it's like, yeah, okay. It's just more coyotes. Right? <laughs> I, mean, <it's, laughs> I mean, like, no, that, that one right there was a Bigfoot um, yeah. out of like an hour of recording coyotes and owls. Um, I mean, I, I think, you know, Occam's razor would be to assume it's an ordinary thing um, unless you have other evidence pointing in a different direction. And if you find that evidence, then good on you, you know, but I mean, until that day when I see Bigfoot uh, coming in his construction crew and building those tree structures, you know, I'm going to probably just assume that Bigfoot didn't make them, you know, the, the X's and the the forts and stuff. I'm going to either assume that nature made them, and it's just random shapes and patterns that you're seeing out there, or maybe humans constructed them. Yeah, exactly. Well, do you think that there are such things as wood knocks? I have no idea. Has anyone ever seen Bigfoot making a wood knock? I mean, the, the reports of anything like that are so rare that how could it be the most common activity that people claim? You know? I mean, if you listen to like the BFRO, <laughs> that's what they do. And every expedition, you're going to um, have them claiming that they heard wood knocks or, or whatever. And, you know, of course, when you paid your 500, 350, whatever dollars, you are really <laughs> deeply wanting to hear those wood knocks. But yeah. on this one BFRO expedition that Ian, Ian Carton and I went to, early on it was down in prairie creek and while everybody else went scurrying out into the woods to, to go on their monster snipe hunt we just decided we're going to sit this one out in the campfire and sure enough in like the several hours that we talked um you could keep hearing these wood sounds going pop 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 crack 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 and you know after a while we're starting to remark on it like what the heck is that you know and um uh, eventually uh, you know after like three hours it there was a big loud crack and then the thing i mean this tree or, or maybe a branch off it just collapsed and fell down in the ground right there in the campsite you know right it's a pretty wild campsite but um there was a dying rotting tree right there you know, it wasn't a Bigfoot doing it. We had no reason to think that Bigfoot <laughs> did it. And why would Bigfoot come into the campsite and do it right there? You know. Interesting. <laughs> but all those people were out there looking for their Bigfoot evidence. And we had the best, the best encounter right there. <laughs> right. You know, right. with the yeah. beer in the cooler and everything. Right. Oh, wow, that's <laughs> those are the best kinds of expeditions right there. You don't even have to leave camp. <laughs> uh, yeah. Well, when you go out to go out like searching around for a Bigfoot, anyway, how do you know you're going to the right spot? Um, like, um, yeah. I guess. I mean, not out of just being lazy, but you know, it's like the notion of just going out into the woods and um, casually observing around you always struck me as the best approach rather than getting all aggressive and banging on trees and, you know, supposedly luring them in or whatever. Uh. I've never seen any evidence of that actually working, but you know, if you do make a bunch of noises, eventually you're going to have something happen. You know, you could do a hundred wood knocks and have no correlation with anything. Right. Right. But, on the 101st one, maybe another branch out in the woods just happens to break around the same time. So then you start thinking in your head, well, that that was a response, right? 
Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, you're going to get responses to owls because, you know, we know that owls will come right up to you. And in fact, around here, they're trained. <laughs> like they, the, the, the <laughs> owl researchers have actually trained the owls to come swoop down and eat a mouse right out of their hand. Well, my wife is you a, a and they'll, as a biologist, they, uh, they basically, because the idea was that they would bring a mouse, then a, the theory was that a spotted owl would take the mouse. And if it had a nest, it would take them to a, take that mouse to a nest and they could follow and figure out where the nest and they could have that idea of the, how many nests, et cetera. Well, what happened was <clears throat> the, if you could use the term dinner bell was the sound of the car door slamming. And as soon as they would hear the car door <laughs> slam, they would fly over and they're, where's my mouth? So, yeah, rather interesting. Yeah, so, I mean, I, I had to really laugh when, you know, on Finding Bigfoot, they were up there in Bluff Creek and Renee was doing her woo, 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 or, you know, strange call that she did. And uh, and sure enough, they heard, they had an owl respond to it, but uh, but of course they had to pretend, you know, for the show, like, what's that? You know? And oh I see I see eye shine. You know, it's like there it is up in the tree moving around, it looks like an owl. But, uh, you know, you can't always say that on a television show. It gets really boring <laughs> otherwise. <laughs> well, Stephen, we're coming up on uh, very on, true on our a little over an hour. And so um uh, getting ready to wrap it up, but what a great conversation. And uh, what do you think, Tate? Oh, I think, Stephen, you've been a great guest, man. I've, I've been looking forward to this conversation all week. As have, yeah. As have I. I'm happy to be on the show. I, I, it's great to have this um, little project that, you know, we started with Robert and Ian. Just continuing to have a life, you know, with new people adding new things. Uh we all do our own kind of contribution to the, to the project. And um, all of us, you guys are just a great group and um, I'm happy to be a part of it. Uh, hopefully there will be more, you know, as, as we grow old and die off, hopefully there'll be some new ones. <laughs> That's morbid. <laughs> no, but like we want to keep this thing going as a real organization, you know, not just an expression of our, desire to speak at Bigfoot conferences or whatever. I support that. I have no, I, I, uh, I totally agree with that. I'm not one for speaking publicly, so that's not me either. I don't like that. I don't like the being in the public eye. I like, I like just doing the, uh, behind the scenes work. It's so much more fun. I I couldn't agree more. Yeah. I I tried. I I got invited. (laughs) I got invited to speak at the Ohio Bigfoot conference, but um, I didn't really feel like going alone. You know, I wanted to get a speaking partner and like none of you guys wanted to go, you know, like, I wanted, I would love, I would have loved to go, but I, you know, just I would have loved to it, time. but the whole job career thing gets in my way, but yeah, I know. Well, yeah, I would, if they would have paid for, um, more than just my travel expenses and lodging, uh, I would have done it like a little bit of money just to make up for the money that I'm not making, you know? Right, but, right. Uh, yeah. But yeah, I mean, for most people, <laughs> like that would be like their glory moment. And like, frankly, for me, I mean, though it's an honor, and I, I mean, I respect Mark DeWorth and anybody who puts on a conference, I, I've turned down a lot of them just because I just, I, it's not my natural environment. You know, I'd rather just talk with people like you in a more personal way. Um, I don't want to get up and lecture from some podium. You know, it's, it seems highly artificial to me. Yeah, well, I, the, very much you know, so. the one-on-one interactions. I mean, like I said earlier, you know, sitting around at one o'clock in the morning, sitting around the campfire with you is always, I always enjoy that certainly, but you know what? Yeah, I have really enjoyed this. And Tate, what do you say? I say, hey, Stephen, thank you for coming on the show, man. And it's been a we blast. really enjoyed it. Yeah, thanks for setting it up. Thanks for listening, everybody. And uh, 
be tuned in for next week. And we, who's our next guest? Or do we even want to say? I don't, I don't want to say, but also I can't remember. <laughs> well, with that, folks, thanks for listening. And again, we are the Bluff Creek Project Podcast. Good night. 